Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CES Live stage here at CES 2017. Thank you all for joining us. You just saw the second episode of our new show, The Future IRL, where we explore all the things that are really happening now, which is still kind of shocking, but I just got to ride in a self-driving car, so these things are real. Joining me now to have a chat about all of the tech that goes into it and what it means and all of the things. First, I have James McBride. He's the Ford technical leader for autonomous driving. Hello. Oh, thank you for having me here today. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. And then we have Jim Zeiselman. He's the VP of engineering from Delphi, and that's the car you just saw me getting to ride around in. Thanks, Gary. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Absolutely. So both of you, I'm, I'm so excited that you could both join me because we, ha we have a lot of time, a uh, lot to talk about and not a lot of time to do it. Um, so let's jump right into how big of a problem is this really? What I saw at Ford the other day when we were chatting about it is you have to basically build a brain, a human brain, and put it into a car. So that's easy, right? Yeah, it's trivial, right? Uh, take uh, several million years of genetic evolution that's happened in our senses and our decision making and uh, put it into a few lines of uh, code in a computer. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Takes a lot of sensors. Let's talk about all of the things. You both have kind of similar setups to my non-engineering brain, I'm sorry. You're like, no, not at all. But can you talk about how many sensors you have and what it takes to sort of get those all together, the both of you? Yeah, so really the sensor suite, in our view, is uh, three major categories. You have the radar sensing, you have the vision, but you also have li LIDAR. And uh, each of these sensors have their pros and their cons. And they typically will work together, right? We fuse all the data coming from all those sensors and put it into the, to the brain centrally on the vehicle. And from that, we're able to you know, drive the vehicle based on policy or, or artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, we have uh, pretty much the same sensing modalities. Additionally, we uh, try to exploit all prior knowledge we have of the world. So if we've been there before, we take advantage of knowing something about what we expect the world should look like. And typically, we have been there before because we're going to validate every road before we turn the car over to you to use on that road. And so we'll make a really high definition 3D map accurate to centimeters. So when we come back, we know where everything should be and what to expect. And then that's the thing. So you know what to expect, but then there's the unexpected. So what they actually have to do and think about is all the, the worst case driving scenarios we've all have had is what they have to, you guys have to think about. And that's why we don't have self-driving cars yet, right? I mean, it's, it's a challenge. How do you plan for that? How do you plan for the unexpected? Well, I, I think she's uh, prompting me with a conversation we actually had before. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often asked by people, you know, what are the remaining challenges? You know, what are hard things to do? And, uh, you know, if, if I asked you what's the most unusual thing you ever saw in your whole lifetime of driving, I can pretty much guarantee you nobody else here at CES will have the same bizarre story that you do. And I'll offer up one of my own. It's not the most bizarre, but I was driving down the freeway at one point, and there was a horse trailer in front of me. And the this bottom is, rusted out. This is a out. bad story. You're going to yeah, tell it. Yeah, the bottom rusted out, and the prize horses went through the, the floor of the trailer, and horse meat was thrown on the front of my car. Now, not many of our, you know, our computer programmers would have written a line of code saying, if horse meat in here, then do this. But to the point of uh, what we need to do is we need to look at these problems in a more generic sense. That really wasn't horse meat, that was road debris. It could have been a box that fell off a delivery truck. It, you know, it could have been broken glass in the road. And what do you, how do you, sure, like most cars now, from what I gather, would stop because self-driving cars are nothing if not overly polite, one could say. Great to ride in, very, really enjoyable, but uh, maybe overly polite. So if it sees, sees debris and stops, well, then you've got a whole pileup situation, right? So you need that quick response time. Well, I mean, humans are faced with the same challenge, right? Uh, depends on the extent of the debris, whether you can, uh, you know, it's small enough that you can drive over it or you can drive around it. The lane next to you is clear. There's a lot of decision making that goes in there. But the point of this example wasn't so much the road debris. It was uh, the, the big challenge in front of all of us is to think about the lifetime's worth of driving experiences we've all had and make sure that our cars are robust enough to handle yeah, in a very safe fashion 
this myriad of things that uh, we encounter, you know, driving the, the roads of the world. In many cases, you know, this really comes from the development of the sensing technology, but also the software, right? So if, in the case of, you know, something falling into the road, if you can determine the height of that off the road and its size, the car can make a decision. Should I safely drive over it? Is it a piece of paper, right? Or is it, you know, the hind quarter of a horse, which I should not drive over? So, and, and today's cars, right? The, the, today's autonomous cars are getting there, right? When you have uh, three-dimensional object detection, you can get a clear view of what that is. And in some cases, depending on what is being detected, you can get a, uh, some clarity as to what will happen with that object, right? If you know where the front of a vehicle is versus the rear of the vehicle, mm -hmm. it's much more likely for that vehicle to be going toward its front, mm -hmm. right? It would, it would never, not very likely, go from side to side. Right. So these kinds of uh, intelligence points are really baked into today's software and autonomous cars. I had a lot of fun playing with both of your sensors, just watching the screen in the Delphi car and seeing how it maps people. And Ford, likewise, you could see the LiDAR sensors covering you know, everything around it. And you could be a person standing beside a Ford car going like that, and it'll see that shape moving. So we're definitely getting close. What are the challenges still in front of us? I know both of you are working on production. You've got a 2000... 2019 19. ready for production. We think they'll be on the road in 2021, just Which like what Ford just says. like when Ford 2021 wants to have cars. But both of you are thinking your autonomous cars are going to be more for like a robo taxi kind of a thing. Would you say that's fair? So I, I they're going to be expensive. I, well, I, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, there's a consensus that uh, an early uh, business case would be in uh, a mobility solution such as a ride share or a ride hailing perhaps even package delivery. Um, there are some advantages to that being a first launch scenario because uh, you can send the vehicles out and have them in close proximity to uh, your service station. So you get them back daily, you make sure the sensors are calibrated, the vehicles are well maintained and taken care of, uh, you can pull the data off of them, uh, and uh, you, you get additional time to uh, amortize the cost of the new sensing and, and compute technologies while simultaneously you introduce a whole customer base to getting a first experience in that vehicle. So there is some dis distinction, I should say. So Ford, you know, as you know, they sell to everyone. Delphi, your car is really meant to be like a robo-taxi. But I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Well, I mean, not necessarily. It wasn't really meant to be a robo-taxi, but we agree that probably the first entry point will be automated mobility on demand or robo-taxis. And you know, not, not only might it be most appropriate, may, maybe the most useful there, but from an economic equation perspective, it also makes the most sense. Kerry, you mentioned it's probably going to be expensive. Uh, it's going to be expensive, maybe not so much as you might be thinking, but uh, the reality is if you can take the driver out of the economic uh, equation when you're talking about taxis, right, you can very quickly get to a business case uh, in this automated mobility on demand where it really makes sense right away. And then over time, we think that that will certainly expand into uh, a mobility for disabled folks or perhaps the elderly, expanding you know, the time during which they can actually have private mobility. And then we think also in due course, costs will come down, like they always do with new technology as we like learn more first, and integrate more. Yes, the first microwave was very expensive, and now they're like 50 bucks if that's you right. buy them cheap. Yeah. That's right. So let's talk price then. Not everybody yeah. at once. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to jump in on this one because it, it's always dangerous to predict the future. But, uh, you know, if uh, for those of you that are remotely old enough, if I were to say back up 20 years in time and I came to you and said, you know, I've got this brilliant idea. I'm going to take your telephone and I'm going to glue a camera to it and maybe a calculator and a bunch of other stuff and I'm going to charge you $800 for it you would have thought I was nuts, right? But I mean, what, which one of us doesn't have a smartphone sitting in our pocket that does just you know, enormous amounts of things for us? And the first smartphones, I, I, I couldn't buy the memory on this phone the day I joined working at Ford for a billion dollars. That's how much this amount of memory would have cost uh, you know, 30 years ago. You know, and now they're pretty ubiquitous, the costs are reasonable, and the only reason that we're willing to pay a slight premium over a regular phone is because this is a complete paradigm shift in how we do our lives. 
and a car that drives itself is a complete paradigm shift in transportation. So there will be a slight premium, but not as much as you think. I, I agree with that. I, I don't want to get to a specific number, but I, I'll put it maybe in percentages, okay? So I, I think in the end, it's probably going to be a 10 to 20% add to the price of the car. That's fair. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, it, and I know, especially for Ford, you know, they first got their start being the working man's car that people, regular people could afford, and that's how we all ended up having cars um, eventually. So I can see how price is a sticky subject, but I appreciate that because... You know, I think people are, th I, people I know are very excited about self-driving cars, but the reality is it's going to be five, ten years maybe until people are, a regular folk are actually buying them. Would you, not the super premium high model Teslas, um, but the sort of more run-of-the-mill cars that more people can afford. Do you say that's fair? I, I, I think, you know, if, if you look at some of the things our CEO has said and, uh, uh, other people in the industry, uh, you know, we've announced a 2021 uh, uh, date for uh, a mobility solution, and we believe by mid-decade, and uh, uh, we should be able to extend that to some forms of personal ownership models. Okay. Yeah. Again, I, I think the personal ownership is still a bit open. You know, certainly there's uh, the entry points, you know, for this type of technology as we described, and and even on the consumer side, you know, maybe the uh, edge cases you know, for the elderly, for example. And, you know, how that makes its way, you know, into the population at large, I think we're all still exploring there a little bit. Right. And I, I think time will tell. But, you know, much like the microwave, right, you know, your parents never asked for a microwave. Nobody asked for a microwave. But once it came out, everybody had to have a microwave. Same goes for the smartphone. Nobody asked for a smartphone. Then now everybody does, in fact, have a we smartphone. So Let's same will happen here. Yeah. Let's talk dream scenario. So I, I get the deadline, and I think that makes sense um, when regular people will be driving self or buying self-driving cars. What do we need to have happen in the tech space that you would love to see? So the idea of roads talking to each other, cars talking to each other, it, is that one of your most wanted items? What would you put? You know, I think first off in the sensor suite, we do need to have uh, some degree of progression on the LiDAR side. From the standpoint of radars and camera and the software and the fusion that controls that, I think we're actually in very, very good shape. And LIDAR, uh, you know, you've seen these, some of these vehicles with the large rotating mechanical LIDARs, you know, obviously not for a consumer, uh, right? So there's a lot of work that has to happen there, plus the cost is quite high. So that needs to become smaller and more cost effective, no, no question about that. Do we need to explain LIDAR sensors real quick? To the audience? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's I'll call it a, a laser light version of radar. So it shoots out light at a certain frequency, and then that gets reflected back. The car receives that reflection and can tell what's out there based on those laser beams. So nonetheless, uh, I think that's a, a key element uh, going forward. Uh, and I think with that, with that corrected, uh, you know, when you start getting into smart cities, uh, you start talking about uh, V to I, vehicle to infrastructure communications. Mm -hmm. I think that can also be quite helpful in the Smart implementation. Smart roadways, all Smart the things. roadways, for So is sure. that something you want bef before, or do you think that'll be complementary? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's an augmentation, right? It will help it be better, right? The, the experience will be better, it, but it will not be necessary okay. because you can't expect that this kind of infrastructure, uh, you know, smartening is it's really going to be everywhere. It's a very large country. Yeah. What would you say? Ford has a, I know, a... I find that we're agreeing on uh, almost everything here, so... Um, Matchmaking yeah, here I on know. the Engadget stage. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you're a genius at this. Um, <laughs> I, I often have to tell people that our cars are presently autonomously autonomous, meaning I have to drive in a world where not all the cars are autonomous, uh, you know, not everything talks to me. And, you know, I have to be backward compatible with the existing infrastructure and society. And so when our cars go out there, um, uh, we, we don't need uh, V to V, we don't need V to I. But that being said, I will take any productive data that the car can ingest because it only makes our solution more accurate, more robust, more safe, and a better experience for everybody. So if people want to add those layers, that's great. We'll consume them. 
the three sensor types, you know, radar, LIDAR, camera, they're there, right? They're there redundantly because you need that information to be certain. This, right, the Vita I and, and the Vita P and the Vita V, this is just more helpful. Treat it as more sensor information coming in. The vehicle to vehicle, I think, is would be amazing. So actually merging could be, it's out of your control. You can't be the jerk if your car is like, no, nah, like we, this is the correct way to do a merge. I mean, that, that would be ideal. We've only got a few minutes left. So real quick, I'd like to talk about the first time you rode in an autonomous car, whatever you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And how you want to translate that to, I mean, I'd imagine both of you want everyone to have autonomous cars one day, probably your loved ones. You want them to be safe. Like talk about that sort of magic moment for you. Well, I, I, I think I'm going to go first because I'm probably older here. Um, I, I literally started driving and not driving, riding in autonomous vehicles here in Las Vegas in 2004. I participated in a series of events called the DARPA Grand Challenges. And uh, in, in essence, the event was uh, the government trying to speed up these technologies for the benefit of uh, our armed forces overseas. and. Uh, so consequently, they were thinking, you know, desert wars at the time, and uh, they held the race right here in the Mojave Desert, mi literally miles outside of Vegas. And so the first time I was chauffeured around was uh, by a big Ford F-250 on four by four roads, uh, out in the rough desert, you know, going really high speed, 50 miles an hour, bouncing over rocks and rough road. And, uh, you know, it was quite exciting. But uh, within days of that, uh, the test engineers in the vehicle uh, we might be on a 100-mile drive to prove out something, and the test engineers would be like, oh, God, you know, this is like, it's more of the same. And then, then it does, it gets kind of boring. Yeah, yes. That's what so, was surprising so to me, when, too. When the car functions correctly, it's uneventful. Uh, uneventful is how you want it to be. You want yes. the car to drive like a very good human driver would, or perhaps better, <laughs> and it's uneventful. It's not the big shock and awe that people imagine it's right. going to be. Yeah, for me, I I'll tell you that... The most defining moment uh, in my history on automated cars happened two days ago. Just two days ago. It was when I rode around in the Delphi It was actually car, right? about an hour later. Oh, okay, what right? happened? It was an hour later when we had another journalist in the car with his videographer, and we were about halfway through our six-mile course when the videographer taps me on the shoulder and says, Jim, uh, how much of the drive will be automated? I said, well, all of it. And he looked at me like uh, I had something wrong. And about 30 seconds later, no, Jim, seriously, what, what portion of this? And I said, well, everything's automated. He said, well, when does she stop driving? He thought the, the safety driver was actually driving the car. Yeah, and I, that's I, when I knew, right, that we really had made some real significant progress. The car drives so naturally. You know, cars cutting in front of us, cutting us off. There's not an overreaction to the braking, right? It's a natural, human-like reaction to that event. So if you were around in 1968, you might remember the line from the great door song, the Roadhouse Blues, keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. Not anymore. Yeah. I, I have to agree with what he says because I've had a number of VIPs in the car and uh, you know, we've been in some very difficult driving scenarios, even for humans. For example, dropping someone off at the departure terminal of an airport, and yes, and, and they'll that constantly is, that is a nightmare for yeah, and they'll machine constantly, and, and human. They'll constantly say to me, uh, "Who's driving? Who's driving? Who's driving?" And I'm like, "Stop asking. The car's been driving the whole time, you know." So for legal reasons, they do need a safety driver behind the wheel. That's still another challenge that we didn't get to touch on. But getting sort of the U.S. government to sort of recognize how we can better test autonomous cars in real world situations, I know that's a whole other. Yeah, it's a just in case, just in case you have someone who can take control. Right, right. okay. Thank you both so much. What an interesting conversation. I wish we had more time. Carrie, thank you very much. Oh, thanks. So Jim and James, we have Delphi over here, Ford right here. Thank you all for joining us. There will be one more episode of the future IRL coming up tomorrow, but you know, everything is happening here at CES. Thank you, gentlemen. See you later.